Acts chapter 22 verse 30. Paul has just been saved from a terrible flogging which could have driven him insane or killed him, certainly left him a broken man if he had gone through it, but he escaped it by claiming to be a Roman citizen, which he was, and the commander cut him down and had a problem on his hands with Paul in chains and thought he could pass the buck by taking Paul to the religious leaders of the nation. Quite clearly Paul was not a political criminal and so the commander thought that by getting the Jewish council to deal with him he could clear the matter up. The commander wanted to find out for sure what the Jews were accusing Paul of. So the next day he had Paul's chains taken off and ordered the chief priests and the whole council to meet. Then he took Paul and made him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the council and said, My brothers, my conscience is perfectly clear about my whole life before God to this very day. The high priest Ananias ordered those who were standing close to Paul to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God will certainly strike you, 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 you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, and yet you break the law by ordering them to strike me? The men close to Paul said to him, You are insulting God's high priest. Paul answered, I did not know, my brothers, that he was the high priest. For the scripture says you must not speak evil of the ruler of your people. When Paul saw that some of the group were Sadducees and that others were Pharisees, he called out in the council, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. I am on trial here because I hope that the dead will ri rise to life. As soon as he said this, the Pharisees and Sadducees started to quarrel and the group was divided. For the Sadducees say that people will not rise from death and that there are no angels or spirits but the Pharisees believe in all three. And the shouting became louder and some of the teachers of the law who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and protested strongly, we cannot find a thing wrong with this man. Perhaps a spirit or an angel really did speak to him. The argument became so violent that the commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them. So he ordered his soldiers to go down into the group and get Paul away from them and take him into the fort. So much for that attempt to pass the back. The following night the Lord stood by Paul and said, Courage, you have given your witness to me here in Jerusalem and you must do the same in Rome also. The next morning some Jews met together and made a plan. They took a vow that they would not eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 of them who planned this together. Then they went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn vow together not to eat a thing until we kill Paul. Now then you and the council send word to the Roman commander to bring Paul down to you, pretending that you want to get more accurate information about him. But we will be ready to kill him before he ever gets here. But the son of Paul's sister heard of the plot, so he went and entered the fort and told it to Paul. Then Paul called one of the officers and said to him, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. The officer took him, led him to the commander and said, The prisoner Paul called me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to say to you. The commander took him by the hand, led him off by himself and asked him, What do you have to tell me? He said, The Jewish authorities have agreed to ask you tomorrow to take Paul down to the council pretending that the council wants to get more accurate information about him. But don't listen to them because there are more than 40 men who will be hiding and waiting for him. They've taken a vow not to eat or drink until they kill him. They are now ready to do it and are waiting for your decision. The commander said, don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me. And he sent the young man away. Then the commander called two of his officers and said, get 200 soldiers ready to go to Caesarea together with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen and be ready to leave by 9 o'clock tonight. Provide some horses for Paul to ride and get him safely through to Governor Felix. 
Then the commander wrote this a letter that went like this. Claudius Lysias to His Excellency the Governor Felix, greetings. The Jews seized this man and were about to kill him. I learned that he is a Roman citizen, so I went with my soldiers and rescued him. I wanted to know what they were accusing him of, so I took him down to their council. I found out that he had not done a thing for which he deserved to die or be put in prison. The accusation against him had to do with questions about their own law. And when I was informed that some Jews were making a plot against him, I decided to send him to you. I told his accusers to make their charges against him before you. The soldiers carried out their orders. They got Paul and took him that night as far as Antipatris. The next day the foot soldiers returned to the fort and left the horsemen to go on with him. They took him to Caesarea, delivered the letter to the governor and turned Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked Paul what province he was from. When he found out that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers arrive. Then he gave orders that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. The one message I get from the book of Acts is that Paul was always getting himself into trouble. It's almost boring by now. The number of scrapes he got into, the number of times he was in court or being hauled about by a mob of angry people or being thrown out of towns and villages. Nobody today would ever ask Paul to be their pastor. They would just have one problem after another to face. Why was he always getting into trouble? There are some who say because he was that kind of person and that it was a temperamental problem and that someone so single-minded and someone so provocative as Paul was bound to rub people up the wrong way and wherever he went he'd just run right across other people. I don't think that's the answer because the troubles in which Paul found himself were exactly the same kind of troubles that our Lord Jesus found himself. And are you going to say Jesus got into trouble because of his temperament? Because he was that kind of a person who is always crossing people? I don't believe that's the answer. I believe the answer lies rather not so much in the person he was as in the kind of world this is. And wherever Christians really do what God wants them to do, I believe they will find themselves in constant trouble. Not because they are that kind of person, but because it is this kind of world. One of the most important questions you can ask is this. Is our world basically a good world or a bad world? If it is a good world, then good people should find life easier in it. But all the facts of our experience run the opposite direction. The harder you try to be good, the more you seek to live by God's will, the more trouble you will get into and the harder it will become. I'm quoting Jesus here as well as Paul. Jesus was an honest person and he made no bones about it. He said, in this world you're going to have trouble. He used the word tribulation, which was a Latin word coming from the name tribulum, which was used of a threshing sledge, which was a heavy piece or heavy instrument of timbers crossed over each other with spikes underneath, which was pulled across the grain to separate the grain from the husk. And sometimes we feel just like that, as if we're going right through it, and there's a threshing fledge, sledge just bashing us, battering us. And Jesus said, that's how it's got to be. That's how it was for him. That's how it will be for you. Because this world, whereas it was once a good world, when God had finished making it and had put people in it, he sat back with tremendous satisfaction as everybody creative does when they've done something beautiful. And he said, that's very good. I like that. That's a lovely world to make. But nobody in their senses could look at the world to say today and say it's very good. Nobody could say that. 
In fact, I believe that our Western civilization, at least, if not the whole world, is going to become more and more difficult a place to live in as Christians. The signs are there, the writing is on the wall. In area after area in our social life in England, it is becoming almost impossible to be a Christian. I never thought that medicine, a high calling if ever there was one, would become a vocation from which Christians would shrink. But there is an increasing number of Christian doctors and nurses who wonder how long they can carry on in their profession, particularly in certain spheres in which they're having to make frightful decisions which they cannot relate to their moral principles. There are Christian policemen, and we've had one of them speaking in this church, who are saying that we're reaching the point where law and morality are so far apart that it's becoming almost impossible to be a Christian policeman. Did you think that day would come? I'm meeting Christian businessmen in certain spheres of business who are saying, I've just got to get out. There is so much corruption, so much bribery expected before you can get a job that I've just got to get out if I'm to keep my moral integrity. And this world in which we live is increasingly a bad world. And the Bible tells us why. The Bible does not say that this world is as God made it or as God intends it. It says that Satan's got hold of it. And the world as a social system, as the system, is not in God's hands. Not immediately. Maybe ultimately. But at the moment, the God of this world and the ruler of this world and the prince of this world... Those are big titles which Jesus gave himself are in the hands of an evil intelligence called Satan. And when I look at the spheres of our social life and see how he's got hold of them, one wonders just how much longer it's going to be possible to remain in society and be a Christian. Take, for example, the sphere of science. Now, my training is science not very extensive, but that was my study before I became a preacher. And I found science fascinating. I found the almost drug-like addiction to discovering something new. I found something in my heart of, of what spurs the scientist on just to go on discovering new things. He's got to go on. There's an urge in him for knowledge. And I, for one, am grateful for many of the benefits that science has brought into my life and into yours, the things that we take for granted maybe, but which science discovered first. But you know, Satan has got hold of science. And the tragedy is that not only is every single discovery that we make capable of being used for evil, and indeed with many recent discovers, discoveries they've been used for evil before they've been used for good, not only that, but now science is unleashing, unleashing such powers that we are living in a frightened age. And the phobia of science is reflected in the reaction to the French atom bomb explosion this week. We're scared stiff of what we're discovering and now that we know that genetic engineering is round the corner and men are going to be able to shape the kind of babies that are born and decide their intelligence and the color of their hair and their sex, the thought appalls us. And it's like a great Pandora's box. That fear would not be there unless Satan had got hold of this realm of human endeavor. And so now we're saying, who will stop the scientists discovering these things? Who will call a halt until we are morally capable of using the discoveries that have been made properly? Never mind the burst of new knowledge that's coming in on us. Why go to the moon when we can't even live on earth together? That's the question that mankind is asking. Take politics. I'm not going to give you a political harangue now, but I can tell you this since the Bible revealed to me what Satan's aim and object is, I can see how he's controlling the world of politics. His object is to have the whole world under one government. 
and to have that government in the hands of one of his servants, a puppet dictator. He once offered the job to Jesus. He said, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. But he will one day offer the job. I know that there are some misguided Christians saying that that person is Gaddafi. They won't be saying it at the end of this week in the light of recent events, but people are looking because they know that one day there will be a man who will be a world dictator, who will be given such power that the whole world will not only be in his hands but in Satan's because he will be in Satan's hands. And can you not see politics shaping up to that? Can you not see Satan destroying democracy by anarchy until people in their fear and insecurity will cry for a dictator who will bring them back some law and order by his own arbitrary and totalitarian authority? And so the Bible teaches that this world is not God's world, that you can't be a friend of God and a friend of the system, that the two are incompatible, and that this world is like a ship that has already been holed below the waterline and is going down. And the people who are dancing and singing on the ship are like those who on the night the Titanic went down, after it had struck the iceberg, they did not realize what was happening and went on singing and dancing in the bars and ballrooms of the Titanic. But it was going down. Now it is that that is the reason why Christians get into trouble. I know that sometimes they can be blamed for tactlessness and for temperamental weaknesses which come out and spoil their witness and we always have to remember that we may be the offense to someone else and not the cross. But even allowing for that, Christians, the truer they are to Jesus Christ, the more they will get into hot water and go from one crisis to another and one trouble to another. And so the life of Paul tells us that it was not the kind of person he was that got him into trouble, it was the kind of world he lived in. It's a world that doesn't love God. It's a world that doesn't want God. It's a world in the grip of Satan. Now having explained the troubles, we come now to the question of tonight. How does a Christian cope with those troubles? What should he do about them? Should he run away from them? Should he fight as he is fought? Or should he resign himself to his fate and accept the troubles? Now wouldn't it be lovely if there was one simple rule to apply to every situation? Either that when trouble came a Christian must fight it or that when trouble came a Christian must simply resign himself to it and accept it or that when trouble came a Christian should try and avoid it. But there is no simple answer to this question except one which I'll come to at the end of the sermon tonight. But here in chapter 23 we have Paul in two different kinds of trouble before the council and under threat of a conspiracy. And in the one situation, he faces it and fights it. And I must say, he gave as good as he got. And he finished up the winner, no question about that. In the other situation, he ran. Or at least he made it possible for himself to be taken out of the trouble. Now, when should a Christian face it and fight it? And when should he go out of it? That's a question we've all got to settle. Well, let's look at the two situations and see if we can get any guidance from them. The Sanhedrin was the council of the Jewish nation and it was fed up with Christians. This was now the fifth time this council had had to meet to deal with some Christian. The first time was with Jesus himself and then they'd had Peter and James and John and Stephen and you go through the book of Acts and this council must have got fed up with being called together. There's another Christian on the loose. And the Roman commander was trying desperately to get rid of his responsibility with Paul by saying he's not a civil criminal, it's a religious matter so you deal with it in the council. And Paul went to the council. Now, I don't know whether you think that Paul was being very Christian in what he did or very wise, but let's see what he did because we can't alter the facts. He opened the case himself. The best form of defense is attack. 
And it's interesting that he opened the case and spoke before he was spoken to and simply got up in the dock and said, I am innocent. And my conscience is absolutely clear before God to this very day. In other words, as touching the laws which this council represents, I am blameless. And he had made that claim in his testimony. Philippians 3 tells us, as touching the law, blameless. And so he took the initiative, which is always a good thing to do when you're under attack, take the first step yourself, and he simply waded straight in and said, I'm innocent of all the charges. My conscience is absolutely clear. And the high priest said, hit that man on his mouth. Shut him up. And somebody nearby did that. And Paul said, you whitewashed war. Now, should he have said that? Is that a Christian thing to do? Remember that Jesus said to people, you whited sepulchre. There may well be a time and place to say this. And you know from what we know of the high priest at that time, a man called Ananias, nothing could have been said that was truer to the high priest's character. Let me tell you a little about him. I did a little research. This man was a glutton to start off with. And everybody knew that the high priest was an overeater which is a sin condemned in the Bible quite frequently. It's one of the seven deadly sins according to one Christian classification. But this man was such a glutton that, do you know, when the people came to the temple, they would sing a perverted version of Psalm 24. They would sing this. They would sing, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the high priest come in and eat his fill of the divine sacrifices. And they sang that in the temple about this man. He was a glutton. He was more than that. He was a thief and a robber. And there were junior priests who had starved because this rapacious high priest had taken the money and the food that should have gone to them. He was not only that, he was a murderer and an assassin. And if anybody crossed this high priest, he arranged for their death. That's what lies behind the conspiracy we read about the next day. And this man had got his job as high priest from Herod. And he'd wormed his way into it. And later this man was to be sought by the crowd to kill him. And they found him hiding in a sewer under Jerusalem. And they took him out and lynched him. Now this is the man before whom Paul stood. And it was the man who said, hit that man on his mouth. And Paul said, you whitewashed wall. How dare you break the law for to strike a man before he's been proved guilty? To punish him is illegal. And Paul is saying, you dare to strike me? It's illegal. I am innocent. Now, I don't think Paul knew all this about this man because he said in a moment that he didn't know that man was the high priest. But I'm telling you that God can enable a person to say something and without their knowledge it could not be a more appropriate word. Whitewashed wall. Here was a man in dock who before God had a clear conscience and the judge on the bench was a man like this. And God enabled Paul to say something that was so true. Somebody standing near Paul said, you know, you've just spoken to the high priest. Did you realize you've insulted the high priest? And Paul at this stage says, I didn't know he was the high priest. That's a puzzling thing. I mean, the high priest would sit in the chief seat and he'd have the high priest's robes and he would be the judge. Some think that Paul was being sarcastic. I didn't know he was the high priest. In other words, he's an interloper. He shouldn't be there. And yet Paul goes on. I didn't know he was the high priest and the scripture says you mustn't say such things to a ruler of the people. It seems as if Paul's eyesight had let him down again. That eyesight that we remember when we studied Galatians, we probably saw that he suffered from trachoma aggravated by the dusty roads, which meant that he could see in a distance a long way away and he could see big writing close to. But one of the symptoms of that disease is that you can't see middle distance. You can't see a face across the room. And maybe that's what let him down. Whatever the explanation Paul immediately states a profound Christian truth that however evil the authorities are, a Christian must always give them respect. 
One of the most astonishing things is that in the days of Nero, in the days of Nero, Simon Peter wrote a letter telling Christians to honor the emperor. We live in a day when people dishonor even good leaders and when they tear them to pieces with sarcastic humor and irony and satire. But a Christian should respect even an evil ruler. And so Paul does seem to be to apologizing here as if his temperament did run away with him and he hadn't realized what he was doing. That put him in a rather weak position. Did you think Paul would shut up? <laughs> no. Did you think he would let the advantage go to the council? Never. What Paul did next was to make an astute observation that there were two denominations represented in the council. And he quickly lined himself up with one and said that he disagreed with the others. <laughs> a very clever and brilliant move. If you want to get away from your enemies, divide them amongst themselves and get them fighting each other. The two denominations in those days in Judaism were Pharisees and Sadducees. I've told you many times the difference. The Pharisees were the conservatives. They still believed in supernatural things. They believed in spirits and angels and in the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees were the liberals. They didn't believe in the supernatural. Religion was all in this life. And so they didn't believe in a resurrection after death. They didn't believe in spirits or angels. It's the same kind of division you can meet among Christians today. You can meet conservatives and liberals. Those who still believe in the supernatural and those who believe in the liberal. Now that doesn't mean that either Pharisees or Sadducees were all that God wanted them to be. But it's interesting that it was from the Pharisees that most of the early Christians came. That a person who believed in the supernatural was always an easier person to win for the Lord. Paul had been a Pharisee and many of the early Christians were Pharisees first. At least they believed in the supernatural even if they got a bit tied up in their strict morality. The Sadducees, I've told you that they were sad, you see, because they did not believe in any future life or in any supernatural dimension to life. And Paul noticed this and he said, I am on trial here because I'm a Pharisee. I belong to this half. I believe in the resurrection from the dead. Now, he wasn't just using this as a gimmick to get out of the trouble. He was stating a sober truth that for him the resurrection from the dead was the key of his whole faith. Jesus had risen from the dead. So he wasn't pulling a fast one. He was stating a truth. But look what happened. Immediately the Pharisees said, well, he's not such a bad fellow after all. He says he met Jesus, but it could have been a spirit or angel speaking. You know, it's a supernatural experience. And they got quite friendly towards him. And the Sadducees got very upset. And the whole thing split down the middle. Now, was Paul right to do that? Was this a Christian way to get out of the trouble? We're left with the question. At any rate, he got out of it just. The poor Roman commander had to dash into the council and take him back to prison in chains. Now, that was the first situation. Was Paul right to tackle it in that way? Was he right to fight back? Was he right to use worldly weapons, and they were, to cause disorder in the council? Let's look now at the next day where he faces a very different thing. You know, you can't stir up people like this without repercussions. And the trouble is that if people can't win a verbal battle with you, they will resort to physical violence. I'm sure you've seen this and experienced this. And the trouble is that when people can't win an open confrontation, they go underground and resort to terrorism. This is what is happening in Northern Ireland. And the leaders of Northern Ireland are trying desperately to bring the thing out into the open where it can be dealt with. But those who know they could not win the battle in the open and those who know they could not verbally present valid reasons for what they do go underground and seek to use conspiracy and force. That's what happened with Paul. And some of those Jews, I guess probably from the Sadducee side, went underground and formed a conspiracy and vowed before God not to eat or drink never make vows to God unless you've thought them through. I often wonder what happened to these people. <laughs> you know, a week later, my, I'm hungry. <laughs> a 
And I guess they found some way, most people do, they find ways to twist their foolishness and get out of it. Maybe they found that uh, God hadn't been listening or something and got out of it. Otherwise, they were dead men. Never make a vow. Do you remember that Old Testament saint who was so grateful to God for a blessing that he vowed he would offer the first living thing that he encountered when he came home as a sacrifice to God and when he came home his daughter ran out to meet him. Do you remember that? Don't make silly vows before God. God will hold you to them because God is a God of truth. Never make vows. They made a vow not to eat a drink and they got a plot and they said to the council, call him back and we'll kill him on the way and it'll all be done secretly. Do you know this is what they did to Jesus when they couldn't arrest Jesus openly in the temple? What did they do? They got hold of Judas and said, can you do it secretly with us? We'll give you lots of money. And when Jesus was on trial, he said, look, I was openly in the temple. You could have arrested me then if I'm saying wrong things. You could have accused me then. Why did you do it in this underhand way? And funnily enough, someone rebuked Jesus at his own trial. Don't speak to the high priest like that. It's just all repeating itself. But the conspiracy was on. Now, it became known to Paul through his nephew. Don't ask me how. I don't know. But the nephew came and told Paul, now what should Paul do now? Trouble is looming. Should he face it? Should he, like a martyr with courage, go right into the arena and face death? Or should he fight it? Or should he escape from it? And on this occasion he chose that last answer. And he got the commander and told him, and off he went with 470 soldiers around him. Now, should a Christian do that? Should a Christian ever ask the police for protection? Should a Christian go to a Roman commander and say, come and deal with this? At any rate, with 470 soldiers, he was fairly safe, and off he set. Nine o'clock at night, can you see that little army setting out? Just to take one Jewish Christian 60 miles away to Caesarea, and so off they went. And he got there safely. I was just so amused when I read the letter that the commander wrote to the governor at Caesarea. Did you notice that? I noticed not one of you smiled. I hope you've been following the last few Bible studies because if you did, you'll see the humor of this. Listen to this sentence in his letter. I learned that he is a Roman citizen, so I went with my soldiers and rescued him. <laughs> Good, I'm glad some of you... <laughs> Do you remember what really happened? The mob was about to kill Paul and the Roman commander rescued him and tied him up to be tortured and then learned that he was a Roman citizen. Now let me read it again. I learned that he is a Roman citizen so I went with my soldiers and rescued him. <laughs> There's something very human about that letter. Just reversing two little facts and missing out the fact that I was just about to torture him and get the truth out of him but anyway it shows that we're still human and that the Roman commander was just putting it nicely to the governor so that he could keep in with him now here are the two situations in one Paul faced it and fought it hard and one in the other he claims the protection of unbelieving soldiers and he goes now which was right we're both right we're neither right how do you find out? Do you examine each situation? Do you say, well, now, in the council it was open and public and he had a chance of winning, whereas the conspiracy was in the dark and he had a chance of losing? Do you weigh up the situations? I think there is one answer to this. It's a very simple and a very profound one, and it applies to every trouble that every one of you are facing tonight, and every one of you is facing some trouble. Should you face it and stay there, or should you run away? Should you do what Paul did in the first half of chapter 23 or the second? Here's the answer. Did you notice that I missed out a verse? What was the verse? 11. Something happened between these two events. After that business in the council, Paul was lying in his cell in chains a bit discouraged because, you know, if you win a battle, 
in the way that he won that battle in the council, I'll guarantee you'll have a reaction afterwards and get thoroughly depressed. And you'll say, you know, was that too much of me? Was I really being a bit naughty to play them off against each other? And Paul was lying discouraged in his cell that night. And suddenly there was someone else in the cell. It was Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, Paul, we rather messed that up, didn't we? And Jesus didn't say, Paul, there was a bit too much of Paul fighting there in the council. Jesus just said, now, Paul, your work here is finished and I want you in Rome. So Paul was willing to go and to run away from the trouble. What's the answer? When you're in trouble, should you face it and fight it or should you turn away from it? The answer is, let Jesus decide that. In other words, the answer is to be the kind of person that Jesus can talk to. And then you'll know the answer. And sometimes he'll say, stay right there. Sometimes he'll say, go. I may have told you about a young man from Charles von St. Peter who shortly after he became a Christian was faced with a simple question of whether he should do something or not. He had been in the habit of going to the cinema in Jared's Cross on Sunday evenings. Not every Sunday, but quite a number of Sundays. And a few weeks after he became a Christian, he began to wonder whether he should go to the cinema on Sunday evenings. And I thank God that he didn't ask other Christians at that stage or that he didn't write up to the Lord's Day Observance Society. What he did was very simple. He went along to the cinema and he stood in front of the box office there. There was nobody else in the foyer at the time. And he said, two tickets, please. And the girl behind said, well, you're expecting a friend. And he said, I've got a friend with me. <laughs> and she said, who is it? He said, it's Jesus. She said, can you wait a minute? And she went for the manager. <laughs> And the manager came and said, what's all this? And she said, he wants to buy two tickets for himself and Jesus. The manager says, well, why do you want to do that? You're wasting your money. And he said, well, I want to take Jesus into the cinema with me tonight and see how he feels about my coming here. Just like that. The manager sensed that it was out of his depth and he just said, uh, well, you better let him have two tickets if he's willing to pay for them. So he did. Twenty minutes later, he walked out of the cinema. See what he did? He wasn't going to go by rules and regulations. And there's something in us once every situation tabulated so that, you know, the matter of guidance is just a matter of looking up the book and saying, oh, that's what I should do in these circumstances. What Jesus offers us is not rules, but a relationship. And provided we are the kind of people he can talk to, then he will tell us whether to stay in that situation and face the trouble and fight it or whether to change our circumstances and go and work for him somewhere else. It's that vital verse 11 in the middle that says, and Jesus came to him in the night. The night is the time when you're alone, when you are depressed, if you're worried about something, but it's the, the time when you can just be quiet away from everything else and all the shouting of the day. And Jesus said, I want you in Rome, so don't fight any longer. Your witness here is complete. You've said all I want you to say in this situation. Go. And so he went. Well, then that means what kind of a person does Jesus talk to and how does he talk to them? And I have a note in my pocket from one of you who was here this morning just asking me to say something about this very simple matter how do you know when Jesus talks? I wish there were a simple answer to this, but at least I'm going to say something I hope will be helpful. First of all, Jesus only speaks to people in crisis if they are the kind of people who speak to him when everything's going all right. That's a simple principle. But how do you recognize his voice when you don't often hear it? And therefore, the first thing is, if you're not used to talking to Jesus normally, I think you'll have difficulty hearing him 
when the crunch comes. That's the first simple thing. And Paul was a person who talked to Jesus normally. And therefore in the night Jesus could speak. The second thing is this, that Jesus can talk to people who are dead to self and the problem is that when we're quiet and thinking, self keeps talking. And self keeps looking at what will happen to self in such and such a course of action. But only a person who's dead to self will run away from trouble at the command of the Lord Jesus. Because you see, it takes courage to run away and not be worried about what people will think about yourself. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, only if myself is totally dead am I free to stay and face trouble or free to run without thinking of what will happen to me if I do either. If I stay and fight, might I be killed or might I be uh, hurt? Or if I run, will people think I'm a coward? Both ways, self is still very much arguing in the picture. Only a person who's dead to self can hear the voice of Jesus clearly telling them what to do. And then self-motives don't confuse the issue. And it's those who are alive to God and whose only ambition is to do what God wants them to do and who are not concerned with how long they live or where they live or how they live who are open to hearing Jesus speak. How does he speak? Here I can only, I suppose, speak within the limits and framework of one's own experience and of what one has shared with the experience of others. There is no single way in which Jesus speaks. Sometimes it comes almost visually. Sometimes there is such a clear picture in the mind that it's very difficult to draw the line between what these eyes see and what the eyes of the mind see. Paul had this problem. He said he was taken up to heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. He didn't know. It was such a real thing that he couldn't tell whether it was his senses or his spirit telling him where he was. And there is a, a narrow dividing line. Sometimes you see a thing so clearly in your mind that you can almost see it by your, with your eyes. I remember almost getting to that point where it seemed to me that the word Guilford was written on the wallpaper of a bedroom in Charlton St. Peter when the Lord was trying to tell me to come here. There are other occasions when a sentence comes to you so clearly that you can't tell whether you heard it with these ears or not. Some of you have shared this experience with me. I've been preaching here and you've come to me afterwards and you've said, you know, when you said so-and-so, 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 that was just what I needed to hear from God. And when they've said the words, I am absolutely certain, as before God I stand here, that I did not say that. What has happened? While they've been listening and quiet and open to the Lord, God spoke to them and they heard him speak, and it was so clear and so definite that they thought that I'd said it. So you can't just draw a dividing line. And sometimes he speaks so clearly that you would take, would have real difficulty in saying he didn't actually show me something to these eyes or to these ears. Other times, it is so clearly not of the senses, but is equally clear that a sentence or a place or a name is so vivid in your thinking. You didn't see it, you didn't hear it, but it's there in your thinking. Maybe a place name. And that's sometimes how Jesus speaks. Sometimes, as you read your Bible, he will take words almost out of their context and they leap out of the page and they're so clear as if they had come in a separate Bible to you, as if they'd come in an envelope just addressed to you. And that word is so clear that Jesus has spoken. Sometimes if someone else is present, it can be in a conversation with them and some words come from them which so stab you very deeply that go straight into your heart that you know the Lord has said something to you. You see, I'm carefully guarding against one way of Jesus speaking to you. 
because there is not one way and that I believe is why the Bible so often does not tell us the way in which God or Jesus spoke to people in the Bible. It simply says Jesus said to Paul in the middle of the night so that you don't ever fall into the trap of reading Jesus spoke to Paul by writing some writing on the wall of his cell the trap you'd fall into then would be to believe that Jesus could only speak to you through writing on the wall of your bedroom. Do you see what I'm getting at? The main thing is for you to be the kind of person that Jesus can talk to. You'll make mistakes in your early Christian life. Every Christian does because your own impulses and the leading of the Spirit are sometimes so like each other in your experience that you will make mistakes. Don't ever believe that you're infallible. I put my arm around a Roman Catholic priest last week and I said, you know, we Protestants have produced far more infallible popes than you ever did. I said, you only produce one at a time, but you should find out how many I meet. <laughs> Christians who say, the Lord has told me, bang. And the hotline to heaven has sent an infallible message. And there's nothing you can do. You can't discuss or pray with a Christian who says that to you. All you can do is sort of bow down and say, okay, well, if that's how you feel, check your guidance. Check it again and again with God's word, with circumstances, with the advice and opinion of experienced Christians. Check it, especially in the early days. But as you grow with the Lord and as you walk with the Lord, you'll begin to recognize his voice more and more clearly. And you'll distinguish it from your own impulses and from the pressures of others. And as you get to know a person, you get to know the kind of thing they say, the kind of tone they use. And sometimes it's not a spectacular voice at all. It's what Elijah heard, the sound of a gentle stillness. There are things my wife can say to me without opening her mouth because we've lived together long enough now and I know what she's wanting me to know. Is that not true of a relationship that deepens? And maybe the Lord has compassion on us in our early Christian lives and speaks so clearly because he knows we're not mature enough to wrestle with the relationship. And sometimes to help us to grow up, he leaves us in a position of doubt and uncertainty about a course of action so that we may seek him the more and develop the relationship the more. And when we've made a mistake, and maybe Paul in this council had made the mistake and overstepped the mark himself, I believe there is an element of that in the story. Jesus didn't chide him for it. He just said, take courage. Let's go on from here. You will make mistakes in guidance. I've made mistakes. Thank the Lord he doesn't chide us for those mistakes. He knew that in our hearts we wanted to do his will. And he says, take courage. Here's the next step. And leads us on. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, there are people here bowed before you now that are facing real troubles. And part of them wants to run away and part of them wants to stay and fight. Lord Jesus, will you speak to them? We don't mind what way you speak, but just speak. And let us know it's you who's talking. We're going to be quiet now and if you're facing a big decision or if you're facing trouble, I want you just to be quiet and, and say, Lord Jesus, I'm here and I'm, I'm trying to listen. If you want to say something to me, just speak. Put within my mind and heart your will.